Jared, you're on. Okay, cool. So, hey, right, I'm Jared. I am a dev on the Pulp team, and I'm here to talk about a new multi-tenancy feature coming to Pulp called Domains. But uh, first, some background on the RBAC work that we've been doing for the past year. Uh, last year, Brian gave a talk at PulpCon about adding multi-tenancy to Pulp so it can, Pulp can be run as a service. And in this talk, he identified around six major and minor problems that he sees that we have to solve before Pulp can be truly multi-tenant compatible. And the first big problem was that our RBAC work at that time wasn't complete. Well, most of that is complete. The roles work has been merged and plugins are now starting to add Pulp support, well, RBAC support, so Pulp file, Pulp container, and Pulp RPM, as Pablo presented in the last presentation, now use roles. And the second problem was that the, the roles need to basically isolate all of the, the files. We have a lot of endpoints with a lot of different objects. And if anybody can see these objects, then you have a problem, because now they're no longer isolated. And so query set filtering has been added to all the endpoints that now support our back and use roles. And it even includes the global endpoints, including content. And so Pulp, as you know, it has stores content globally so that it's all deduplicated between the repositories. And we get around this uh, ownership model where basically the ownership is global by determining if you have permission to view the content, if you have permission if you have a repository that has that content in it. And so even if uh, user Alice has a repository foo and they have a only content A and B, they can only see that content A and B even if they go to the global uh, content endpoints, even if there's like 100, 10,000 contents. And then we also added extra upload permission checks based off this repository access condition. And so this has been the major big issue that we identified first and that we've been working on for this past year. Whoops, did not mean to start playing the video. <laughs> the second two problems that he identified that was not gonna be covered by our current roles work was the fact that content, since it's still global, can be stolen or manipulated if you're a very nefarious actor and know how to, uh, basically fake pulp. Uh, if you know what type of content that you want to steal, you can set up a fake source that has your fake content in it. And then during sync, this content can be added to pulp or it can be taken from one of the pulp already has stored. And so an example of this is if you want to have malware so that other users afterwards download malware, as long as you sync your content first, and it's your source, then Pulp on the second sync will then go and say, oh, hey, I already have this content, and now I'm going to give you the bad content. And then vice versa, if you want to steal someone else's content, even if you don't have it, if you know the weakness constraints of that content, as long as you sync and it's already present, now you can take that content, even if it technically didn't belong to you. And so this can't really be uh, solved with our current roles. Maybe it could be if we looked very, tried very hard and deduplicated some stuff. But that is a big uh, limitation. That's a big problem. Users definitely do not want, especially in a multi-tenant system where they don't necessarily trust each other. They don't want to have their content stolen or be manipulated by other users. And then the second problem, and this definitely couldn't be solved by roles, is that the namespace, names in, for objects in Pulp are unique. So even with the query set isolation scoping, where the fact that you can't see your other user's objects, you can still know what objects exist in Pulp by the fact that you can't create an object with the same name. So if user Alice creates a repository name production, now no other user in the system can create a repository name production. And this doubly applies to the distribution space URL for getting content. In the content app, we need to know the base URL has to be unique across all of the distributions or else we wouldn't be able to match from the content app back to the distribution, the server content. 
Again, this is the same problem. A lot of times people like to use the same common identifiers and nomikers for their objects. And so if a user has a distribution that they're already in production, then now no other user can have a distribution in production. So one of the solutions presented and the one that is being added to pulp is a new namespace object called domains. And this domains is going to isolate all of your objects into its own little, basic kind of think of it as a mini sub instance of pulp. The domain has a unique name across the whole system and all objects within the domain are now unique within that domain. So before, uh, user A, user Alice could create a repository in production, and now no other user can create a repository in production. But now they're working with inside a domain. User Alice has her own domain named Foo, and she can have her as many repositories she wants with any name, as long as they're unique within that domain. And then user Bob can now have his own domain bar, and now he can have the exact same repository names, but they're his own repositories. This feature is coming in a future bulk core release and it's going to be a completely optional feature and it's going to be off by default. Uh, so this means that your pulp is still going to be backwards compatible with all the other plugins. And in order to enable it, you're going to have to turn on this setting called domain enabled and then restart your pulp instance. Um, Besides the namespacing feature of domains, there is another crucial aspect to solve the first problem of content being able to be manipulated and uh, stolen. And that's the fact that domains are now unique across their uh, artifacts and content. So each domain stores their own versions of that. They're no longer deduplicated on a global level. And to help accomplish this, each domain can now have their own storage backend. And so user Alice wants to use AWS S3. So in her domain foo, she can now point it to her own instance. And user Bob with his domain bar can use Azure if he wants to. We have support for any of the backend systems that Pulp supports. And another little niche feature is that you can use this domains feature, but if you still want to only have one say you're a user with multiple domains, but you only have one storage backend, you can technically use the same storage backend across multiple domains. And within that storage backend, the artifacts are isolated um, from different paths. Now, if your uh, storage backend does deduplication on its own, then that will just be a nice benefit. But uh, within the domain, they're all isolated. So some of the major changes when you enable domains feature is that domains, the domain name gets added to all the pulp URLs. So in the pulp API, the domain name comes after the API root and right before the API v3. And then for the content app, the domain name comes after the content path prefix, which is usually pulp slash content. This is necessary as every operation needs to take place with inside the domain and pulp needs to know what domain you're working in in order to be able to properly isolate everybody. If you're upgrading a system and enabling domains, all the current pulp objects will be found underneath a default domain called default. Very convenient. And then all future pulp objects will live in the domain they are created and can only be used within that domain. This is a strict isolation requirement. So even if you're an owner of multiple domains, you cannot use objects within those domains. So if I say uh, user Alice owns domain foo and bar, and in foo, she has a remote uh, remote uh, A, and bar, she cannot use remote A to sync her repositories. She's going to have to create a new uh, remote and domain bar. Cool. And in another um, object, there's some, yes. <clears throat> when this feature is turned on, are there any migrations that have to be run or is it just a matter of restarting the services and the feature is on? It's just a matter of restarting the services. Cool. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, yes. So most pulp objects will be inside a domain. 
but there will be a couple exceptions. I'll get to some of the more notable ones later. But some of the shared resources within the pulp instance, like workers, um, are not part of any one, one domain. And so these will technically live in a domain. I mean, because now domain is required in all URLs, you need to specify one in order to see it. And so these objects that don't have any domains will be in the default domain. Uh, so the RBAC has also been updated to work with domains. And the three notable objects that do not belong to any domain all relate to RBAC. And these are roles, access policies, and user slash groups. So these are still at a system level and are technically global. And so a system admin will, should be the, probably the only one who is able to modify these objects. Roles have been updated to now also uh, work, be assigned on a domain level. So like uh, Pablo was talking about before in the last presentation, currently roles can be assigned on either an object level or a model level. This model level is basically akin to a global level throughout the system. But now with the uh, introduction of domains and wanting users to work at only within their domain, the domain level has become the new global level that system admins should assign. So make sure that the, your users can only work within that domain. And then access policy has had their access condition checks updated to include domain level checks. So um, if you are using non-customized uh, access policies, then the, you'll get this update for free when this feature is enabled. Um, if it is customized, then you'll have to go and add in the appropriate condition checks when you enable the feature. OK, so now I'm going to give a little demo to uh, show off domain functionality. Can everybody see my terminal? It looks good. Yes, we can. OK. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry about that. I need to bring up my commands for my demo. OK, so I am going to create some domains. And let me first show off what the domain object. Oops, oh, domains create, just dash help. So domains has four attributes that you can set. Two of them which are required. Uh, there's the name, which is obvious. That's the unique name that has to be uh, assigned to the domain that you'll use in your URLs. And then there's the storage class, which is the storage backend that your domain will use. Um, the storage class can be any of the pulp storage object backends that we sort that we support. Um, there's an optional description, and then there's a, another setting for stored settings. So these are the settings that you would usually specify in your uh, settings.py file for your backend. When you're setting up your domain, this is where you would specify it. So I'm going to create, on this system, I have uh, two uh, backend set up, well, three backends, actually. My pulp instance, if I go to status, is using a, this, the default uh, domain is using a file system backend. And you can tell that domains are enabled by this new uh, field in the status endpoint. But I also have, uh, so yes. this is a clean install. Sorry, can you repeat it's that a, question? It, it's, a, it's a fresh install, it's not an upgraded version where there yeah, was like pre-domain and after-domain. OK, thank you. But on my system, I also have access to two different uh, backends, one that is an S3 equivalent, this Minio, and an Azure equivalent. So I'm going to create two domains that use these two different backends. So the first one will be foo, and that will be an S3 backend. Whoops. Which I write the right command. 
And then the second will be the measure. And then now if I go and list out the domains, you see my two domains, var, who, and the default domain. Now domains live outside of domains, so they appear in the default domain space, as you can see. And default is a special domain, it is always present in the pulp system, and its storage class is default. It will use whatever is your default file storage that you specify in your uh, settings.py. So now let's create some objects within the domain. And in order to specify the domain, there is a new domain field within the CLI. This would be if you're using um, HTTP requests, you would just put the domain name within the URL. So I'll create a repository named foo in the foo domain. And I'll create, let's create two repositories in domain foo. And then let's show that now the, the name uh, Uniqueness constraint on repositories is no longer global. It's now per domain. So in my domain bar, I can also create a repository name foo. And so now if I take a look, you can see the one domain, the one repository in domain bar and the one repository or the two repositories in domain foo. And if you don't specify a domain within the CLI, it will use the domain, the default domain for that CLI profile, which by default is default. Uh, and I don't have any repositories in my default domain. So let's perform a sync and show that the content is also now isolated per domain. So create a remote in repository foo, or in domain foo, and perform a sync. And Jared, you said you could set your domain in your in your CLI profile, yes, so that I you know, I always yeah. okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to I'll get that in. Uh, later when I do some examples with users. So in domain foo, you now see that there are content, and these contents are specific to domain view. And if I were to check domain bar, I can see there's no content. And uh, if I go and do file remote this. So right now, I'm working as the admin user, so I can see all the objects. So I'm going to try to take this uh, remote that's in the view and sync it in my repository in domain bar. Um, sync name foo remote. And I'll get an error because I'm trying to perform an operation in domain bar but the object I'm passing in is in domain foo, and these objects are not of the same domain. And so this, you strictly cannot use it, even though I have permission on both of these as the admin user, only objects within the same domain can be used. But it doesn't mean all this hope is lost. You can still do it the old fashioned way and create a distribution and expose your content, and then sync it the normal way from one, oops, one domain to another. So let's create a new remote in domain bar. And this URL points to the content in domain foo through the content app. And then now we can sync. So now we have a remote in domain bar.
And now if we list out our content in domain bar, we now have the same content. But now this, this content is specific in domain bar. <laughs> um, and so this content right now is stored within uh, in domain bar, is stored in Azure, while the domain content before in domain view is stored on S3. And we can see that if we were to take a look at the content app. So to show you do need the, the domain name. If you don't put the domain name, you'll get a 404. So if we go and look at domain foo, we have our distribution foo bar. And if we were to look inside it, we have our links. And if I were to download one of these, oops. We will see that the location is from the service that is uh, for the domain backend. And so for because we're in domain foo, the backend is the S3, and so it's serving the content from S3. Hey, Jared, I see a hand raised from Grant. I know you can't see because you're sharing. Oh, OK. Yep. Oh, I forgot that you can't see the hand raised. My apologies. Um, the you can't use things across domains. That applies to things that are in the default domain as well, correct? Yes. OK. So if I have if I have an old style pulp instance and then I turn domains on, any objects that exist in that old instance are going to be in default. And if I want mm -hmm. them to be used elsewhere, I'm going to need to recreate them. Exactly. Yes. Cool. All right. So let's continue. So now I'm going to get to the point you were bringing up earlier, Grant, about CLI profiles. So let's create some users. So right now I've been doing everything as the admin user. And so I'm going to create Alice and Bob. And then I'm going to add their profiles to my CLI. I've already gone ahead and done this. But as you can see, so here's the the admin profile, it uses the domain default. And here is Alice and Bob's profiles under C, A and C, or A and B. And for these, I want Alice to have domain food. And I want Bob to be of domain bar. And so these will, when I uh, run commands as these users, um, they will default to this domain in their setting. So we can show that off real quick. So if I do a listing of repositories from Alice, you can see it auto uses the few domain. And if I were to do a listing of repositories as Bob, it would use the bar domain. Now, these users are freshly created, and so they have no permissions and therefore can't see anything, even though we know Foo and Bar both have repositories in them. So let's add some assignments, some permission assignments to them. And I'm going to show off the new domain level permissions that we have been added. And so um, as Paul showed before, using the pulp user role assignment add, we're going to assign it to Alice, um, the file repository viewer role, and we're going to assign it to domain foo. Now, this uh, command, as you can see, isn't using a user, so it's going to be using my default user, which is my admin. And now we have our new uh, our new permission added, and so if we go back and run the File repository list, I can now see all the repositories in Foo. But if I were to go and say, try to see the repositories in bar as Alice, I would still get nothing because I only have permissions to view the repositories with inside Foo. So let's go and try out assigning uh, object level permissions 
it works the same as. What does the dash PA in the command do? Uh, so P is the profile, and then A is just the name of the profile. This is just like the shorthand. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, I'm just using some clever uh, tricks with the CLI. Should have a, another talk for advanced CLI tricks. <laughs> uh, so let's assign a object level permission to Bob, who, as I said before, is only using, I want him to use the R domain as his default. But, you know, I'm a finicky admin. I, you know what? I want him to be able to see this one object. Even if all of his other permissions would be in the R domain, I'm a nice guy. I'll let him see this one uh, repository. And so, can sign this one object. And now, if I were to view repositories as a normal Bob uh, in his normal domain, I still won't be able to see anything. But if I switch over to the domain that this uh, for the repository I gave him access to, switch over to domain foo, I can now see this domain. And because it's on object level, I can only see the, the one object uh, that I gave permission on, even though there are two repositories within uh, domain foo. And one last example. Uh, so as Pablo was talking about before, in order to create objects, we would have to assign these roles at the model level. So it doesn't really make sense to have a create role on an object level, because you don't already have the object yet. You need to create it. So now this uh, permission within domains can be done on a domain level. So now you can have your users only be able to create objects within a domain. You don't have to worry about them creating objects across every domain. So I'll let Bob have permission to create uh, domains in his, uh, or create repositories in his domain bar. Now, if I were to create a repository, it should work. But if I were to try to create a repository in previous domain, in the first domain, domain view, I should get a pair denied. Yep, you do not have permission to perform this action. And so that is all of the domain functionality in a nutshell that has been added to Polk. So let me switch back to my presentation and go over the last two slides. So uh, some of the current limitations on domains. So as I was saying before, uh, default domain is always there. And this domain is needed as an implementation detail and thus is currently immutable and cannot be updated or deleted. And then because of our URL structures, the names API and content have been reserved domain names that you cannot use when creating your own domains. This should prevent confusion for the router when uh, is trying to differentiate whether the request should go to the API or the content app. Another big uh, limitation is that all domains must, all plugins must support domains in order to enable the feature. So if you have a multi plugin uh, installation, each plugin has to have domain compatibility support added to it in order for you to use this feature. Uh, this is different than the current RBAC implementation where you can have each plugin have its own. RBAC, and it would only use that RBAC if that plugin supports it. Uh, with domains, in order to maintain compatibility, all of the plugins must support it. And then all of the current tasks are been mostly converted to work with inside that domain, but some notable exceptions are import, export, and sign services. These two uh, tasks and objects um, deal with objects or deal with the file system on the pulp system. And it doesn't really, it didn't really make sense, or there wasn't a clear way to implement these features in a domain, domain, domainized way, where users can specify where they want to uh, get this stuff out, 
having to rework these uh, these features completely. But in the future, they maybe could be supported with some more design work. And finally, for the future domains, um, this feature is going to be added within hopefully the next pulp core release, and then it will be off to the races adding domain support to the next plugins. Our next plugin that we want to focus on, it will be part pulp RPM. Um, so like uh, Grant, or I think Dennis was saying earlier, uh, when you have an existing system and you turn on domain support, domain support, all of your objects will be within the default domain. And if you want to move it over, you're going to have to go and manually recreate all of those objects. And if you want, if you want to move all the artifacts over, that would require a lot of syncing. Um, so we want to add a feature to easily switch the storage back in. And this would work within domains and even without domains. But this should hopefully make it much easier to um, start using the domains feature. And lastly, we want to add more metrics and controls for monitoring slash restricting that occurs within domain. And so if you want to run your Pulp's uh, system you as that? a service. You said monitoring and restricting what? Uh, monitoring and restricting activity within domain. So an example okay. is if you're running a Pulp system as an admin and you're using it as a service, you want to maybe monitor how much a user is using their domain. So how many tasks, that, sync tasks they're issuing, how much content they are downloading from the content app, um, how many repositories and publications they're creating, et cetera, et cetera, and be able to probably issue fine, uh, find more finer controls over it. So say you want to limit them to only do you know, 100 syncs a, sync a week so that there are, you don't have your users all spamming your resources. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, this is the discourse link for discussion around domains design. If you want to pop in, take a look, there's a couple links in there with some more in-depth looks at the code behind it and documentation on how to add domain support for if you're a plugin writer. Yeah, any uh, extra questions? So Jared, that last um, monitoring control, you're looking for, um, sorry, trying to think how to, how to phrase this. Basically is, is a way for the, the super admin, if you will, the person who's responsible for all the pulp to set guardrails around domains and or users um, in order to both, I mean, I could see that as one, I, I only have, I am the person who's paying for all the service server hosting. So I need to limit how much disk space my individual domains can take up, for example. Um, I can also see I'm a service provider. And what I wanna do is provide a free tier of pulp domain access and then a basic tier and then a galactic tier where you get as much as you can eat and that's the kind of the, the direction you see us going with this is letting you you set up guardrails like that is that is that make sense yep um so this is actually a reference to the last yeah. year's talk brian's last uh, point or last problem for multi-tenancy support is that there are no current restrictions on resource access. Um, right. right. So as a user, one of your users could just be spamming the tasking system with a bunch of sync tasks, and now no other user can perform syncs. Uh, and if you have constrained resources, you need to be able to find a way to restrict your users so that everybody can have a share of the app. Uh, right, right. Well, I could see this metrics and controlling uh, feature be applicable, not necessarily for a deployment, which is having enabled domains. Even if the domains are off, I believe these kind of metrics might be useful too. That's true. I could see that, Ina. Um, I'm not so sure whether we need to go in the controlling business, but I'm definitely on board with the metrics. 
I could see that being a stepwise kind of thing too. Know know what what's out there is a first step, and then the second step is be able to say no. Um, um, and I'm just thinking about the tasking system. And this is me architecting off the top of my head because we have a couple of minutes, so I'll take 30 seconds. Of I've got you know a hundred different domains in my pulp instance that's running on some Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster somewhere, and there's a ton of pods out there. Um, and there's one user who's allowed to create tasks. And he creates a lot of them. And another user says, um, I need to get my tasks processed and we're out of workers because the the tasking system is full. I could see us getting to where you could you could you could expand on this. So this is we have not architected out the possibility of this domain gets to use that pod of pulp workers, that 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 group of task workers are assigned their own domain. And as long as as Alice using the foo domain has a task that whose required resources, whose locked resources don't collide with, you know, Bruce on domain bar, who has his own set of tasks, then they can all run in parallel on separate systems. It feels like the architecture we have would support that um, going forward because of the way domains are named. So I'm syncing into my domain, none of my repo resource names are going to collide with the resource names of somebody who's syncing into a different domain. So this, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud that that this allows us that kind of flexibility. We're not, I don't know exactly how we would do that, but we could in fact get there without having to re-architect the work you're talking about here. Two thumbs way up. And to the, the folk, Brian and Matthias, and Dennis for the tasking system that also will let us do that without having to be rewritten. So also two thumbs way up. And Daniel. <laughs> and Daniel, absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Let's see. Do we have a feel for who the first, the first user of this will be? Um, I think so. Are we allowed to say? Oh. Oh, we may not be because that's that may be something that hasn't been announced yet. Never mind. Yeah, um, I don't know, but I do think that um, it would be this is a good area where because the feature is so new, we want to probably have some sort of a telemetry gathering for its use. Like, mm -hmm. how many systems are enabling domains? And yes, that's even just knowing that, and maybe like how many domains are being used on that system. That's mm -hmm. nice and anonymous, I think. Um, the the proposal process for telemetry metrics has like a review process. So we um, could make sure that it's acceptable there. Um, but yeah, that I think that is a, a good way to think about it. Very cool. Uh, related to the discussion earlier about controls and, and monitoring, um, uh, I'm definitely perceiving a theme, and I'm really happy about that um, and excited about a theme about kind of metrics and monitoring around Pulp. I think um, that's right for our project's life cycle and what our users need. Um, and so uh, the controls part, though, I do think has a slight distinction that I want to make, which is mm -hmm. um, when you providing metrics um, is outside of Pulp, for external systems is great because those external systems can take action to uh, either notify people about problems or provide scaling events and things like that. So the, the control loop there occurs in between pulp and an outside system. So the thing about the, con the controls here that were kind of discussed here are pulp in the application itself is the thing that's actually the other side of the control group of the control loop um and so i think that's one if they fall into that category where the thing that needs to take action is pulp itself as an application then that puts the whole responsibility kind of on a, the developers to 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 make that happen so i see that as like it's very much related but it is slightly different because of that quality Very cool. Other questions, folks?
Okay, can I speed run my presentation? Should have uh, added some more commands to my demo. No, I think you did fine, Jared. Um, with something this complicated, you're better off having a focus thing that gets done a little early than running over and have everybody going, but I had a bunch of questions and then losing losing that information. Well, I hope one of the goals of the design was to make it as simplistic as possible and keep the amount changes to a minimal. Um, so hopefully it should be very easy to turn on the feature and just keep on working and everything should work just like how it was before. As you know, there's it's really at the end of the day is kind of just a namespace. Um, I think namespacing is a pretty simple concept for most people to understand. Um, and the main requirement is that you just have to add your domain name to the URLs, and everything else just works. Um, so I really hope simplicity will make it a easy feature to use. I could absolutely see a request coming in from community and, and users of, OK, I want to turn this on in my existing system. And what I would really like is a wizard that lets me say things like, OK, repositories, foobar, bletch, and bang, all those I want to have be accessible in these three domains. Can you help me with that? Um, and that much, so that is an opportunity to write tooling above the, the, uh, the API level to do smart things for users to help them copy the stuff that they already have into the domains that they're trying to create um, just to help the, the uptake, if you will. Um, so we might want to think about how that might work, because I'm sure those requests are going to come in. I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd start working on them right away, but we might want to think about how that would work um, as we start making this uh, a thing that people turn on you know, out there in the world. Yeah, I agree. Um, over the past year, I guess, I guess I didn't talk about this in the background slide, but the uh, one of the major problems for our internal group working on all this RPARC work is that we're kind of trying to guess the mind of the user on what they want. But we're, we're mainly pulp developers, so we don't actually have a good understanding of what the user wants. We, we, but we still want to create these features so that the users start using them but we're in a kind of a catch-22. And so hopefully by creating the simplest, most um, potential feature, we encourage users to use it. And then once they start using it, they'll realize where the weak spots are, come back to us with requests, and then we can improve the, the feature. Uh, and I that's all we can really do. Um, if we just sit <laughs> and wait for <laughs> users to tell us exactly what they want, um, we'll be sitting here for a real long time. So yeah, I'm absolutely. really glad to see this work moving forward. Um, and yeah, maybe we'll have Pulp 4 with even better uh, domain support. <laughs> um, Very cool stuff. It, it wouldn't be PulpCon if I didn't mention Pulp 4. <laughs> I was just going to say that, literally. OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we're calling back to a presentation from Carl Trioff last PulpCon. Um, what he, what I remember from that presentation was that, um, if you research shows around decision-making for projects, not just software projects, is that, um, whether you take a long time or a short amount of time to make a decision, um, you will probably make roughly the same percentage of good and bad decisions. Um, and what that suggests is that the best way to make good decisions um, isn't to think about them for a long time, but to make them somewhat quickly. That's probably not quite the right word, but, um, and then evaluate your decisions on like an ongoing basis. So um, I'm really happy to see this feature being released. I think it's excellent um, and we'll learn from it and then we'll make um, the next, um, you know, best decision we know how right after that. That's something I took away from last year's presentation with Carl. Very cool. Any other questions?
So if we don't have any more questions. Um, can I suggest we give everybody uh, looks like 14 minutes uh, and we will uh, come back on schedule for the next presentation. Uh, who is next is Lubash, yeah? Content signing will be up next at half past the hour. Does that sound good to everybody? That's good. Outstanding. Great job, Jared. Daniel, if you could stop the recording.